2021 marks the 10th anniversary of Legacy Machine, a series which started with a simple question, what would we at MBNF have wanted to create 150 years ago? Hello and welcome to GB Talks. I'm Varun Godino, Deputy Editor at Gulf Business. I have with me today Max Gusset, the founder of Swiss watchmaker MBNF. MBNF is an independent watchmaking brand and makes some of the world's most avant-garde timepieces. It's also one that is highly sought after by collectors worldwide. Max Busser's creations have been creating waves for the last 16 years, and especially the legacy machine, which this year celebrates its 10th anniversary. Here to tell us more about the 10th anniversary of the legacy machine and also of the brand and his plans for it is Max Busser himself. Max Busset, welcome to GB Talks. Great pleasure. MBNF was founded as a rebel brand. Uh, it went against the corporatization of watches, against the business that watchmaking had become. Um, it went against the idea of hiding the names of co-collaborators of watchmaking. Um, how rotten was the state of affairs when you decided to start up MBNF back in 2003, 2004? Uh, look, I don't know if it was broken. I can tell you only that I was very angry. And I think anger has been a very big um, motivator for me at the beginning of MBNF. That was 16 years ago. I was angry against myself because as a creator, I think I'd sold out and become a marketeer. I was always creating products because I thought they would sell, not because I actually liked them. And I hated myself for that. And I think the, I was angry very much against my industry because the high-end mechanical watch industry has become incredibly successful and economically incredibly important. But at, at least my perception in those years was that um, had never been as little creative as before. And when we had no money, the industry was way more creative than when it had a lot, which actually makes sense, unfortunately. Uh, so it was um, a lot of anger. And I set my, my path on this crazy journey of doing my own thing. It's not about changing the industry. It's about being proud of what I'm doing. Well, give us an, uh, a business overview of MBNF today. Uh, the number of watches made annually, the number of markets present, the number of boutiques. And if we're open to discussing annual revenues, average prices, just give us a business overview of MBNF. So I created the company uh, 16 years ago, put all my savings in it, which was about, uh, I'll say about 3 million dirhams, which is a lot for any normal person. But if you want to create a mechanical high-end watch brand, creating your own calibers, it's just peanuts. You need way more than that. Luckily, my first retail partners, uh, amongst them the Siddiqui family here in Dubai, believed enough in me to pay me a little bit in advance. And that's how it started. And I was the only employee in my flat for two and a half years. Fast forward 16 years later, we are now 31 in the company. Uh, our revenue this year should be around, I'll say around 80 million dirhams. Um, we um, craft generally about 200 to 220 uh, horological or legacy machines a year and everything of course is all crafted in our workshops in, in Geneva uh, with the help of the friends which are all the, the small artisans which were who work with us in, in Switzerland. Um, what can I tell you um, we have um, never made a loss. Amazing. Uh, we have no debt, we have no shareholders and it, it helps because typically uh, beginning of last year when Covid hit I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be game over. So I was expecting to do minus 50%, which seemed reasonable in March last year. And we're going to make, I don't know, easily 10, 12 million dirhams losses, which we could have weathered because I've left all the profits of the company in the company. But it was, um, it was a very, very scary moment. And uh, in June, that was for March, in June, I realized... It was business as usual. It was actually better than business as usual. Even though 90% of our retailers were closed because of COVID measures. And we ended up the year at plus 30% in sellout. 
Amazing. So we actually, our revenue went down 14%, one four, because mm -hmm. we just couldn't uh, deliver between the lockdowns and our suppliers having issue. So we produced much less pieces. The sales at our retailers were much higher, which basically made an enormous void. Boom, all this the inventory disappeared from the, the few pieces which were in the retailers disappeared. And uh, we started up this year in an uh, Olympic form. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Um, we just, um, during January, presented our first semester novelties to our retail partners, of course, through Zooms. So before, we used to do that in, in watch shows in Geneva and Basel, all that's finished. Um, and we took four to one. So just let me explain. Four to one is every piece we're going to craft this year, we took four orders. Now, in a previous life, pre-COVID, I would have been super happy to have 1.5, meaning you take 50% more orders than what you can deliver. Four to one. Every retailer who's ordering four pieces of reference would get one if he's lucky. And so um, something has happened. Something has happened. Some sort of a insane acceleration has happened uh, last year. I also have to mention that in 2013, when my first daughter was born, I took a very clear decision. The company wouldn't grow anymore. And um, and so, yeah, it grows marginally every year just to cover the increase in cost. But uh, it's there is no, we don't want to grow. And, uh, and so from 2013 to 2021, we're doing more or less the same revenue. Uh, but the demand has suddenly gone absolutely insane. So that's in, in a nutshell. Um, well, I'm going to get to the legacy mission very quickly. But just before that, let's talk about the main families of MBNF. So you have your legacy machines, you have your horological machines, you have your performance art, and of course, the co-creations. Uh, just give us a quick overview of how these are segmented and sort of what each one of them brings to the table. There is a historical... Um explanation to all of this. So horological machines are my 3D kinetic art pieces, are the foundation of what we believe in and what MBNF is about. And uh, it was all about saying watchmaking is art, and therefore I deconstruct traditional watchmaking and reconstruct it into 3D art pieces. I mean, a bit like what I'm, I'm wearing on my wrist now. And it's really the foundation. Then in 2011, nobody understood my team less than anybody else, that we came out with the legacy machine, the very first round classic piece, which of course was a very big twist to it, which was LM1. And it was a different way. Whereas HMs are my autobiography and my psychotherapy, LMs are my way of saying thank you. They're my way of giving tribute to the great master watchmakers of the 18th and 19th century. So legacy machines start from here. Our logical machines start from my guts. And, uh, and so they're very different uh, ways of creating. I've become basically schizophrenic. Um, then performance art. Uh, I discovered after my first years of creating that I actually enjoyed giving some of my pieces to artists, creators, designers, watchmakers I admire and tell them, you do whatever you want and transform it. It's, it's a very tough blow in your own ego, because as all creators, we have an ego. So you're giving it to another guy's ego, and he starts modifying it. But from there, you start creating a child. It's got the DNA of both parents and a, a child which would never have existed if you were the only parent. And so there, those are experimentation, artistic experimentations. And then co-creations is when I create for other brands slash manufacturers usually Swiss, very uh, conservative, super high-end uh, brands like uh, Lepe, the oldest high-end clockmaker in the world, uh, Rouge, the only high-end music box manufacturer, Carondage, very famous uh, high-end pen manufacturer. And I come and I sort of uh, electrify them <laughs> with my crazy ideas. And if they let themselves, if they allow me to do it, then these crazy ideas come, and uh, and but they're, they're products that they sell. We don't sell. It's, it's there. I just design for them. So there you go. That's in. Uh, those are the four uh, chapters of my creativity today. Right, and let's get to the big talking point: uh, the legacy machine. Ten years. Um, tell us what it took for piece number one. What did it take when it, when piece number for piece number one to come into existence? Well. 
there was absolutely no plan to have a legacy machine line. Actually, there was no plan at all when I created MBNF. I had HM1, had a design of HM2, but it was not at all what it ended up being. And I had a vague sketch, which even I probably couldn't understand, of three. And that was it. And I set upon creating my company and basically created as I went. Uh, not knowing tomorrow what I'm going to create is very interesting for me, meaning I don't have a strategy. I don't have a plan. It's, oh, I feel like doing this now. And um, LM1 started off as an HM, meaning it was going to be a 3D kinetic art piece, completely crazy. And it was the beginning of my uh, balance wheel fetishism. I am crazy about balance wheels and escapements. And 99% of the time in watches, they're in the movement. You can't see them or you have to maybe at the back. And, and so I was drawing a piece. I was trying to draw a piece which had a cylinder incorporating the balance wheel, another cylinder with the hour minute, another cylinder with the power reserve, or whatever I, I drew with my friend Eric Giroud, the independent designer I've been working for all these years. It was just horrible. <laughs> it was either horrible, it was ugly, it was unwearable, and it was going on for months and months and months, and Eric was getting more and more sketchy on this, and uh, I was getting very disheartened. And one day I just went, you know what? Let's forget all of that and sketch exactly what is going to be LM1. Round watch, so we're gonna put two pocket watch dials. We're gonna have this flying balance wheel on top of the dials. There was not yet the power reserve that came later. And we, and we set upon, I say we set upon. Everybody in the team was like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> like, what is this? This is not, we are, you remember, we are the rebels. I mean, we are the force. I mean, we are not going to go to the dark side. And, uh, and so uh, I had to basically, I had to bully everybody because there was no convincing them. They didn't want to do this. And then when we managed to get Jean-François Mojon, the engineer, and especially Kari Boutilainen, for me, is arguably one of the two greatest classic watchmakers alive to come on board. I think then my team, started going, oh, there's maybe something here, but they're still looking at it, you know, like, we'll take care of it, but not too much. And, um, and so LM1 came out um, in 2011. And again, I had no other LMs in the pipeline. Actually, it's not true. I had LM2, which I had the idea while we were doing LM1, which is the two flying balance wheels. And um, we, we, we set upon, so, I mean, again, all the calibers you've seen since, they've now eight with LMX, have been ideas which have come later on. So the initial idea of LM1 is what? The very, very first flying balance wheel. Meaning, not only is it something you can see uh, under the dial, it's actually flying on top of it. And not only is it flying, it's enormous. It's a 14 millimeter balance wheel. It's three times the size of any normal mechanical watch today because I wanted to see that. I wanted to see this incredible hypnotizing movement with, of course, the escapement uh, anchor underneath. Um, I also um, had this idea that I needed a two time zone watch, which could go into countries where you've got half an hour time zones, like typically India or a few others, where um, if you've got a GMT, forget about it. If you've got a dual time zone, forget about it. And, and so uh, that's the first actually completely independent two time zones. And then we did the very first vertical power reserve indicator because it was all about 3D. And it ended up being realizing that this is what I probably would have created if I'd lived a hundred years before. That sort of so slowly gelled while I was creating this piece. I, there's no spaceships, there are no planes, there are no cars of everything which has inspired me in my childhood which I can actually anchor in the 1800s. There would have been the Eiffel Tower. There would have been the five skyscrapers. There would have been the, the novels of Jules Verne, uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and From the Earth to the Moon. And, and so I think that's what it would have influenced me. So it's a very, um, yeah, as I said, it's a very intellectual uh, creative process compared to our logical machines. Yeah. And uh, we're going to pull up a couple of images now of the Legacy Machine 10, the special edition. Um, while we're looking at it, talk us through it. So seven calibers have been done, 10th anniversary. And for me, for the 10th anniversary, it was really important to go back to LM1, the original. 
and to take everything which made LM1 so breathtaking when it came out, it got the Oscars of watchmaking, the Grand Prix d'Orlogerie, et cetera, et cetera, and basically multiply that, make it even wow, more wow, more crazy, more three-dimensional. So we started off, of course, a completely new movement with instead of one barrel, the barrel is what gives you the energy, you put three barrels, and you can see on the back of the watch these three barrels, and they are going to give, instead of 45-hour time of power reserve, seven days. And when you turn it around, you've got this, this city under a dome. The two time zones, which were flat, have gone at an angle. And that's done through conical gears. We're the only uh, watch brand manufacturer who actually masters conical gears. We're the first ones to, to integrate that in, in mechanical watches, and nobody's managed since. And um, it's, of course, this incredible flying balance wheel, even higher. It's got more components, mechanical watchmaking components, on the base plate because that's what we love to look at. So you've got these beautiful polished bridges with the uh, minute uh, wheels, which are floating on the, uh, on the base plate. And at the back, remember we created the first vertical power reserve indicator. We create this incredible contraption, which is not only a vertical power reserve, which actually goes up and down, it also rotates on itself. Meaning that once you've finished winding it up, there's a clutch which opens up, and then you can continue turning and the whole power reserve indicator turns on itself. So you can choose if you want it on the side written one to seven days, or if you want it on the side Monday to Sunday, uh, as it's a seven day power reserve. On top of that, the finishing is absolutely mind boggling. We've really gone, I mean, I think Kari Vutilainen brought us to a completely different level, uh, which virtually doesn't exist anymore 10 years ago. And we wanted to honor that and do better. So um, there will be very few of these pieces. Uh, we're talking of, we hope to be able to craft 25 movements a year. And um, the initial launch uh, edition will be uh, 18 in red gold and 33 in titanium, which is 51 pieces. That means it will take two years to deliver. And uh, we're pretty sure by the inkling of what we're seeing already now um, is that at launch it will take less than five to six days for those 51 watches to be uh, accounted for. There was a time, uh, let's just call it January 2020, when if we ask Max to say about e-commerce, he would say no, that's not the way we'd like to go. But that has changed, that has changed rapidly and dramatically over the last couple of months. Um, Tell us about that and, and, and you know, what caused that shift and, and what your strategy is for e-commerce. We've, we've had for many years an uh, e-commerce platform for our Mad Gallery. So the artists we curate, you could actually buy online. It was very, very uh, unsuccessful. <laughs> we never sold anything on it. And, um, and we never put the watches because we thought, anyway, I mean, if... if if a 10,000 dirham object is not selling online, how is a 400 or a 600,000 dirham watch going to sell? So no point in putting our watches online to aggravate all our retail partners and not sell anything. So of course it was like, no, we're not doing it. And then uh, March last year, 26 out of our 28 retailers um, closed. So suddenly we had no more retail partners. Now, what I didn't know is what they were going to continue selling while they were closed. But that month of March, we thought we have to do something. We can't just sit down and start moaning and, and crying. We have to do it. So we, we put up the watches online, but not all of them. We barely have three, four, five at any given time. It's a bit like at the market. So I'm sorry for the analogy because much love is going to hate me. But when you go to the market, what do you have? Oh, you've got zucchini today and you've got maybe radish and whatever. It's a different depending on the season you will have different pieces. It's not about putting the whole catalog. And also what we added, which was a world premiere, we actually every month have a watch, which is usually the last of the series, which is at one of our retail partners, which is featured. Because there are often people looking for pieces, but they don't know that they're out there. And so uh, typically now we have a legacy one in platinum, which is the last 
new piece in the world. There were 33. Uh, it's in New York. And so if you go on our website, you say, if you're looking for that, we will tell you that's where it is. So we put that online and didn't sell anything. <laughs> so that actually concluded that it was not a good idea. That was March, April, May. And then in June, during the launch of the uh, LM101 Moser collaboration, boom, a person went online, bought the watch on the day of the launch, somebody we'd never known, we didn't know of, who'd never bought an MBNF, put the on its credit card and done. I'm like, oh, wow, okay. Hundreds of thousands of francs for that. Uh, 200,000 dirhams, approximately 220,000 dirhams, something like that. Yeah. And then, end of the year, a second, a third, a fourth, two 600,000 dirham watches, one 500,000 dirham watch, all to customers we had never met, we'd never bought an MBNF before. And we're just putting in basket, charging to their Amex Blacks or whatever it is, and buying the watches. Of course, we contacted them after, it's like, excuse me, but who are you? What are you doing? Why are you buying our pieces? And uh, oh, I've, I've been following you guys, and I just thought, yeah, now is the moment. And then we realized, okay, it's only, we finally only sold four watches out of the sellout last year, which was 260. But I think it's the beginning of something. I think it's actually showing that people are really changing the way they're purchasing online. It's happening to me. You know? I mean, before pre-COVID, I would buy maybe, I don't know, books and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, bathing shorts. <laughs> I don't know, something like that, something small. During the last year, I've bought some much more important things online. Uh, because it's become more or less uh, normal. Um, the Hublot CEO, I interviewed him earlier this week, uh, said they're working on a platform where you can buy, or, or very soon you'll be able to buy a Hublot watch using Bitcoins, another cryptocurrency. Tesla said very soon you'll be able to buy a Tesla using Bitcoins. Any plans for purchasing a MBNF using cryptocurrency, Bitcoins? It's pretty easy to do. Um, we haven't enabled it because I must have we've got so many other projects going. We're more into the creative stuff. I mean, uh, I can't even talk to you what's coming out, but over <laughs> the next couple of years, get ready. Um, and it's true that, yes, we could do it. Um, probably we should at some point, but I haven't yet seen the, the urge to immediately put that into place. Being an independent watchmaker can be a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you get complete sort of creative and operational control over what you do. But on the other hand, you do not have the fallback and the safety net that comes with being part of a larger conglomerate. Um, have you ever considered the flip side of it? Um, and at some point, at, at some fleeting moment, wish that you were ever part of a larger conglomerate? And will you ever, ever be part of a larger conglomerate? There's this old saying that when a, a captive uh, fierce animal has tasted blood, you have to put it down. Um, what I mean is that I have been free to roam the countryside for the last 16 years, doing whatever I wanted with, of course, as you said, uh, a certain amount of economical hindrances. But as I said, we've, we've never lost money. We've no debt, no shareholders. Nobody to account with. I, I take whatever decision I want, which are always super long-term decisions. That's very important. Um, whatever I, I, I took a decision, I think I can actually say before MBNF that pride will be always what will make me take decisions. What I mean is you're all the time in your life and in business at crossroads. This idea could make a lot of money, but you're not very proud of it. That idea is not going to make much, if any, but you'd be super proud of it to have your name on it. I always take that one. And at every single crossroad for the last 16 years, it's been choosing the pride one. And that is interesting because I realized that just a few weeks ago in an interview, somebody asked me, what regrets do you have? And I realized I have none. Because every decision I took was pride generated. Therefore, even if it failed and... <laughs> of course failed and 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 were, were at complete flops but i was still proud of them because even though they didn't make any money they were the right decision well if you start making decisions 
because they're money oriented and they and they're a flop then you've lost twice you've lost the money and you've lost your pride so from there onwards um I'm, I'm not going to say never, it's never going to happen. I'm 54 years old. I started the company when I was 38. My, my children are very small. I don't know what I'm going to be at 65 or 60. I, that, actually, I have no idea what decisions I'm going to take in the next few minutes after this interview. That's the beauty. I have no idea. And I, I discover as I go and decide, oh, this is better for me or rather than that. But today, there is absolutely not only no reason, but why, why would I go and work for a big company with all the red tape and the politics and, and, the, and the lack of creativity and the people trying to have to validate everything 12 times? Do you know, we, we were just actually realizing this morning, we have, we're celebrating eight calibers, eight movements in 10 years on LM. But during that time, we also created and came out with seven calibers and HMs. That means in 10 years, MBNF, a little company, a company which does 80 million dirhams is a very little company in the watch world. Most brands do 20 to 50 times what I do. Um, came out with 15 new movements in 10 years. There is nobody in this industry Nobody, even those who do 50 or 100 times our revenue, have done even half of that, a quarter of that in 10 years. So being free is being free to create. And I don't see why I would change that. We know uh, that Siddiqui was one of your earliest backers uh, before your, years before even the first MBNF time piece came about. Dubai is a place you call home here along with your family. Um, and it's also where, of course, the Siddiqui family is based. Tell us about uh, the relationship with Siddiqui. How has it evolved over the last couple of years and possibly even strengthened through this pandemic where, you know, honestly, retailers had to put in their bid to support independent watchmaking? There's no saying. It's in, in tough times that you know who are your real friends. And that applies in personal life like in business. I met Abdul Majid Siddiqui 23 years ago when I took over Harry Winston and it was about to go bankrupt. Yeah. And he helped me out then when he didn't know me. And he was one of the, the few people who helped me save Harry Winston. Seven years later, I come with my drawings of my first MBNF and ask him if he's ready to play the game and not only order, but actually give me a little bit of money in advance. And he's one of the six who says, you're nuts, but okay. <laughs> Um, there are very few people like that out there in the retail world because retailers are, are actually usually more short-term driven. Uh, and the Siddiqui family is an ultra long-term driven family and business. And they, they, their decisions are led as much as mine on super long-term and real relationships. They don't give their trust easily, but when they give their trust, it's extraordinary. And I'm exactly the same animal. So it's been a symbiosis. Uh, last year was our best year ever. This year, and I know I'm not supposed to give numbers in this uh, uh, about that, but this year, in the first three months of the year, we've already done over 50% of last year's revenue. That's and amazing. we expect that MBNF in Dubai, we'll do about plus 80% this year if I can manage to uh, deliver the pieces. Because as I don't want to grow, that means that I have already cut four out of our 28 retailers in the last three months. And we're going to cut more just so that we can allocate more resources here. Finding opportunities in COVID. Um, the COVID pandemic has been a time which has affected businesses tremendously. But I'm going to flip the question around here. How have you as an entrepreneur, as a businessman, as a creative individual, found opportunities within this pandemic? Has it meant new strategies, new ways of doing businesses, finding new markets that wouldn't have been on your radar had it not been for the pandemic? 
Um, I think we at MBNF did whatever we could. There was no real strategy to it. Clearly in the month of March, we thought it was, as I said, it was gonna be a disaster. We couldn't, I couldn't travel, nobody could travel. Um, the retailers were closed. And we ended up doing incredibly well. A, first of all, through a digital link, which we never severed the, the link. I was really amazed that many uh, big brands, and I'm not only talking watches, but also mostly watches, um, stopped coming out with new products and stopped communicating. Um, while we, on the contrary, continued creating as we always do. We didn't stop any of the, the products which were coming out. And we went on social media and we're out there. And the, the thing is, when you're on social media, be it an IG Live or now a Clubhouse or whatever, you have to be real. There is no corporate message which can be going through social media. And when people are in anguish, when people are scared, when people are blocked at home, however wealthy they are or not, they don't want to hear another corporate message. They don't want to talk about status. They don't want to talk about the usual things that luxury world talks about. And it was all about talking about humanity, beauty, and emotions. And, and we, we just talked about us and how we, we, we were scared and how we felt and how, why we did things, giving the why, sharing the why. And we had an enormous following suddenly. We already had a pretty nice following before, but it just went like that. And I think the brands which did incredibly well during this pandemic um, where either those who were actually already speculative, famous four brands in the watch industry, which if you can get your hands on one, you're going to sell it immediately for more money. And so they became hard assets. People were not buying them because they were watches, or because they wanted to wear them. They were just buying them because they thought I can make money with it. And, and then there were a few artisans like us. We're not the only ones who just completely skyrocketed. Uh, F.P. Jaron is one of them, Recep, Recep, and others, probably names most people have never heard of um, because uh, we're real, because we actually tell our story as it is. And we connected there. Um, that's, that's for me the most important lesson of, of the pandemic. Right, uh, Max, I'm coming to the end of my interview. My last question to you, in fact, uh, what can we expect from 2021? What's gonna be the way forward um, as you know, recently, uh, the Bayern Wheel, it's the Bayern 2040 plan. They're already thinking 19 years ahead. I'm sure you've, uh, uh, as you mentioned earlier on, you go as you take it as it comes, but of course there are long-term plans. Um, what can we expect from MBNF? So we, we shot off with the HM9SV, which was incredible, unveiling LMX, which is a 10th anniversary LM. And then there's another caliber at the second part of the year, and there uh, it's an incredible collaboration also with somebody who's going to be very amazing. And, uh, and on top of all of that, plus a few other things, there will be um, a creative concept, which I've been working on for years, which will, I think, uh, amaze everybody, which I can't talk about yet. And you're going to see probably in a few months. So um, all of that in a nutshell in 12 months. And of course, because our movements take three, four years to develop, we're working on the next, I think we're working on 2026 as we talk. Uh, so that I know what's coming out, but afterwards I don't know. Max, thank you very much for joining us. We really do appreciate you giving us your time. I wish you all the very best uh, with the 10th anniversary of the Legacy Machine and also all the best for the brand and for 2021 too. Baron, thank you very much. Always a pleasure. Speak to you soon. Do remember to follow us on all our social media channels, including Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Thank you to each one of you who have joined us and watched this episode of GB Talks. Thank you and goodbye.